Hello there. Welcome back to the Sky Guys podcast. Talking all sorts of Star Wars stuff here. I'm your host, Mike Phillips. Join me today, as always, and as we see the narration every single week. Pete Constor is here. Pete, how are you? Doing great. I'm pumped for this episode. Um, super excited to talk with you guys. So uh, I want to give it away too, too, too much here. But yeah, super excited. Yep. Also with us here today, uh, the, uh, pr- the producer of this podcast, the executive producer, Nick Frey is here. Nick, how are you? Well, thank you for that that title, but I'm doing well. Doing very well. Very excited to dig into this episode. Yes, yeah, so to be clear, at the end of last week's podcast, with the ben- abandoned Star Wars prize, we said the Ray movie podcast draft is coming. The character draft's coming. We had some news come out. We had a big guest coming here. So just to reset the schedule here, here's what's going on. That podcast is coming out in two weeks. So two weeks from now, Pete, we are going to do the character, the Ray movie draft. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely excited for that. Um, curious to see who you guys pick. I'm going to lose, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. The big news that Nick is going to talk about in a minute here with the Mandalorian. We're going to go deep into that next week on the podcast. And we'll do a draft for that movie as well. So that's coming next week. But this week, Nick, we got a big special guest here. A few weeks ago, we covered a story in the Force on the podcast. We had a chance to sit down with the producer of the movie, Kyle Newman, is coming on here in a few minutes to talk with us about this, uh, the Service in the Force documentary. Could not be more excited. Uh, I'm a fan of, uh, obviously, the documentary, but also the Fanboys movie that he was behind. So very excited to get into that. Yep. So let's get into what we usually do here. So Pete, people want to subscribe to the Sky Guys podcast. Do so on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Spotify, Amazon, all your suspects. Simply search for the Sky Guys here at Podcast Platforms. You get all our episodes there. And just as a suffering friends, hello, you're getting this episode as a bonus because it's such a cool interview. I not want you guys to miss it, but we have a lot of fun stuff going on in the offseason over here for the next, next live action show. Yeah, all this offseason content, again, you're getting this little treat because it is such a special episode, but all the offseason content that you're missing, you got to be subscribed, right? Um, so go ahead and subscribe. It's free. You get a bunch more of us. You know, you want to, you know, you love listening to our beautiful voices talk about Star Wars. So definitely subscribe so you get all that offseason content. Yep. And uh, Nick, if you want to follow us on social media, how can I do that? They can follow at Sky Guys Podcast. It's on Instagram, on Twitter X, on Threads, and TikTok. Yep, you can also follow follow uh, the YouTube version. Mike Phillips on YouTube. Video version of the podcast is here. Uh, we are going to celebrate the holiday special, so I'm going to go ahead here and get the prop real quick for the Lego holiday special set. Here's so. my prop. Savage Press. Funko yep. Pop, I believe a GameStop exclusive. And apparently it glows in the dark, but i got to be honest with you. Not down here in the dark. It's, it's usually dark down here when I'm, you know, not on camera and it does not glow in the dark yeah all right okay, so here's the lego holiday special set so that's coming in here ray's holding our sacred jedi text pete as always as always all right so one other thing i want to mention before we get to the news here is that we do are participating as i mentioned as i'm gonna mention for the first time here we are going to be an active participant in star wars podcast day and what is Star Wars Podcast Day, you might ask? It is coming on February 7th, 2024. It is an unofficial podcast celebration for Star Wars fan audio. Remember, it's the 25th anniversary of the very first Star Wars podcast, the first episode of Jedi Talk, aired in on the, that day in 1999. So, Nick, we are participating with a very special Star Wars Podcast Day episode coming on February 7th. Yeah, us and many others are, are involved. Uh, they've been posting frequently maybe once a week twice a week about it and um very excited for for everyone involved and obviously including ourselves uh, for this this is a great honor and privilege to be part of this yep all right so that's the that's the star wars podcast day news and let's get to the regular news nick here and uh i believe we have one we have a couple of mando items including the very big award win sure so mando season three won a creative arts emmy for outstanding stunt performance for chapter 24 which was the finale right that's the finale yeah the finale of season three so good for them there congratulations um and and you know i not to say that that's not to say that we should just move on but there's much bigger news so i'm very excited <laughs> to just get into it here and that is that uh star wars has announced the mandalorian and grogu 
which will be going into production as a movie in 2024, directed by John Favreau, and it, um, produced by Favreau, Kathleen Kennedy, and Dave Filoni. And um, this is in addition to previously announced movies and teases that we'll get to dig into. You know, we're going to get into a little deeper next week. Yeah. So to clarify here. This is not taking the place of either the Ray movie, the Filoni, Air of the Empire movie, or James Mangle. This is an extra movie, Nick. Right. This is another movie that's coming, perhaps serving as season four of The Mandalorian. We'll, we'll see when we get a little bit closer. There was a rumor about that a few months ago, that there was going to be a rumor. Then all of a sudden, they said no, and now here we are where it looks like this might be the case. So we'll, we'll see when we get closer what exactly this movie is, but that's what it looks like. Yeah, and Pete, we, sir, we don't want to keep you guys waiting for 20 minutes for us debating about this for Kyle Newman coming on here. So we'll talk about this next week. Do a whole episode about this next movie next week. Yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll dive into it. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get that information to you guys. And the last thing here is in that same press release, but in the small text on the bottom, you had to zoom in to see it. It also said Ahsoka Season 2 is also in production with Dave Filoni. Yeah, so Pete, we got renewed. I, it was so it was so nonchalant. It's I mean, I, I think we were talking about it off the air about how they had to like re-release something to say. Hey, by the way, guys, you missed this part. Um, it, it, interesting that they put that in the same press release. You know, you think there'd be two different things, but uh, it, I'm I'm super excited. I think this. Uh, I thought the season uh, the show needed a season two. I'm excited to see more Ahsoka. So no complaints here. Yeah, and uh, Nick, we'll also discuss that a little bit next week. Not as much as Mando, but we'll get in that conversation a little bit as well. Yes, we will. And is that it for the news department? Yep, that is it. All right, I want to thank Nick for doing the Star Wars news here. We have our main event today, a very special guest on the podcast here. We covered the uh, the Star Wars and the Force documentary at the 1978 Star Wars holiday special a couple weeks ago. We loved it here. And we're very pleased to welcome on the podcast today uh, one of the producers of the of the documentary, Kyle Newman, is here. Kyle, welcome to Sky Guys. How are you? What's up, Sky Guys? Thanks for having me on. Thanks for covering the doc. We appreciate seeing uh, fans get into it and fans spend their time talking about it. So uh, we are very grateful you guys even uh, checked it out. Thank you. No problem. I'm very glad that like we got a chance to check it out because we had our own crazy series of holiday special. So definitely a lot of fun to get more perspective on it. Yeah, you know, if we all learned something on this one, I don't think there's there's that one expert in the world. Maybe Scott Kirkwood, who was involved in it too. He he's like runs the holiday special fan website. He's got quite a collection of knowledge, but we all learned something in the process of making this, and that's always a good thing. You know, not coming from it as like, oh, I know everything. I'm just going to tell everybody about it. It was discovery, so we were excited about a lot of things that we learned. And was were able to put on screen, which is always great hearing it from the people who made it, you know. Yeah, that's for sure. Here, uh, Nick, you want to lead us off? Yeah. So, like right away, I want to just dive in and get to know, like, a, how did you get into Star Wars? Are you a fan? And 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 b, like, what do you like about Star? What what content did you like? What content do you not like? And uh, yeah, just kind of get your background on your Star Wars fandom. I'm really a Farscape fan. No, I'm kidding. I'm I'm a diehard Star Wars fan from day one. Um, literally day one. I think you know the first my first memory is seeing Star Wars with my family. I remember the movie, but I remember afterwards the energy around it. There was cousins and everybody was there in a parking lot. And people were buzzing, and it was probably late in the summer of '77, maybe even September of '77. I was born in '76, so I was about 18 months old. So I don't know how I remember this stuff. But uh, from then on, it, it, I was obsessed, and I just learned Star Wars words before human words, so I could talk about Snaggletooth or Greedo before I could say my brothers Kevin and Kimberly. Um, I was just hooked, and my older brothers were into it. They had toys. One was 10 years older, one was 8 years older, and I just assumed their collections, especially when they went off to college. Oh, I have a little junior Star Wars fan crap crashing our podcast. <laughs> Hi, buddy. Sorry. Oh, oh good. Um, so I was about his age, two ish, and um, I became a fanatic. So um, it's then it's become like a lifelong, you know, affiliation. I, I I can't live a day without correlating something to Star Wars, quoting Star Wars, thinking about Star Wars. If it's not 
you know, talking about a show or movie that I'm, I'm into the books and re-listening to audio dramas or, you know, whatever. It's I'm obsessed. So Star Wars is, is a part of my daily life. It's a lifestyle. That's yeah. great. Is there any is there anything that you would say is your favorite piece or least favorite piece of media in terms of uh, maybe some of the movies or shows? Um, you know, I don't normally talk negatively about movies. I know how hard they are to make, but I've always maintained honesty when it comes to Star Wars as a fan. You know, um, I, I will always you know talk about it and not pull punches. Um, I love obviously the original trilogy. I am a prequel fan and fanatic. I love. I've probably seen Phantom Menace a hundred something 200 times um i love the brian daly han solo novels i love the brian daly npr radio stuff i'm a big fan of air to the empire i think about that maybe more than i think about the movies sometimes um so i love that those early timothy zahn creations i love force awakens for uh it kicking off something new like the pilot of what could be I feel like it was largely unfulfilled. I am not a Last Jedi fan at all. Um, I rank that pretty low. I'd say that and Attack of the Clones are down there for me. Um, holiday special level. Um, otherwise, I pretty much love most of it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty even keeled when it comes to, you know, Mandalorian. Uh, I'd say six out of every eight episodes are pretty good. There's a couple where I question it and I and I and I do it honestly and I and I just think that's what that's also good about fandom. It's healthy. We can't just it's so rich and so big and there's so many different ways to make and tell Star Wars. So of course we're gonna bring our our opinions and experiences into the mix and some we're gonna connect with more than others. Like I love Andor, but I don't think every show can be Andor. If every show was like Andor, and I know if all these people are like, that's the best Star Wars ever, and like it's really good. I love it. But that can't be every Star Wars, you know. Um, it's almost my criticism of Andor is a little bit embarrassed that it's Star Wars, you know. It's like, sorry guys, there's a stormtrooper, you know. Sorry, there's a TIE fighter. It's it's almost doesn't want to fully commit, but it's so good and it's so well written and the characters are so well drawn and it's it's beautifully made and it's beautifully performed and it's 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 impeccable. I love it. Um, so I try to keep it. You know, pretty honest. As much as I love Star Wars blanketly as a as a franchise, it's my favorite thing in the world. I think it's the gold standard for entertainment. Um, there are things that could be could be done better. There's things in the past that could have been done better. Um, but you know, being a, a filmmaker myself and knowing that it's not easy, you're making you're telling a story with hundreds of people as your your tool. It's like having a paintbrush, having a thousand people, having to move the paintbrush in the same direction. It's not easy. It's it's a very um, impure medium, although it's this great amalgamation of all these different mediums that are, are pure. And, um, you know, that's that's one thing you have to keep in mind. There's a lot of money on the line. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of business on the line. There's there's shareholders on the line. There are a lot of elements. Marketing sometimes takes a greater precedence than content. And you see that in all studios. It's like they don't worry about the movie. They worry about the marketing of the movie. That has to hit. Um, so there's a lot to factor when you're talking about Star Wars these days. It's not just George making a trilogy of movies and taking a three-year break and getting it right. They are a multifaceted, multi-platform, living, breathing mega company that um, has to operate on all these fronts and hopefully do it in concert and satisfy a lot of different people. And that's beautiful. That has such a rich diverse fan base but it's it's hard to cater to everyone you know and that's people expect it to all be catered to them and it's so diverse that it really can't be so i i see why there's so many little pockets that have formed in fandom and so many little you know people gravitate towards one thing but not another and that's that's understandable considering it's it's approaching 50 years so yeah i like i find the good in everything you know and even the ones I don't love, there's elements I I do love. Like Last Jedi, I don't love it as a Star Wars film, but it's a it's a well made movie. You know, I just have um, you know issues down in its DNA. So 
Yeah, for sure. That was Defin- definitely. Sorry, Mike. I was just say definitely appreciate the honesty. That was that was fantastic. And uh, Mike, you want to get more involved in the actual special itself? Yeah, because obviously we can we can talk about the last Jedi for eight hours if we wanted to, but we're not going to do that. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not it's it's not going to help anything. You know, everybody has their different opinion on it, and it's almost came and went. You know, it's there. It's not going away. Embrace the things that are good in it. Yep. You know. And it makes the trilogy, it's part of the pipeline, it's there. I don't love Attack of the Clones the same way I, I love Phantom Menace or Revenge of the Sith. It's it's there. Um, I don't hate it, but I don't, you know, I'm not going to just pop it on leisurely, you know? Yeah. So. That's for sure here. And obviously, like, one thing that we didn't do leisurely with time is, like, obviously, our holiday special experience came in 2021 when we started this podcast. You know what, like, Holly's coming up, like, let's watch this thing, because none of us ever seen it. And it's something that, like, it was crazy for us. Like, Nick's fiance at the time was saying, like, what the hell are you watching when she saw him watching this thing? And that's what the most few minutes. So we want to ask you here, like, what was your first experience with the Holly's? Because obviously, I don't think you're watching, you're two years old. Well, I remember my brothers wanting to watch it. Um, I remember, I think I wanted to watch it. It was... I think I was upset because they were upset. We had an event or something going to my uncle's cousin's house. And we're like, what? The holiday special's on. I remember them just having like a fit. So they couldn't watch it. I think it was on the TV at my uncle's house. So we saw some of it. And then we got in the car and I was really tired. We got home and they put it back on the TV. And I think I fell asleep. Um, Maybe that was told to me. I don't know if it's a memory or, you know what I mean? It's one of those things where I was about to. Um... I don't know. It was one of those things where I forgot about it for a long time. And then I was at Comic-Con in New York City, I think in 1992, where I was collecting comic books. And I went in there, I was trying to get Jim Lee's autograph on an X-Men. And I came across a Star Trek table. And the vendor asked me if he had Star Wars stuff. And he looked at me very derisively. And he was like, yeah. And he pulled out this dirty brown box. And it was just like contraband star wars it wasn't even cool star wars in 92 it was dead um and star wars could have went the way of just like the cult film you know but it was resurrected in the 90s we all think it had this great run but it was really it wasn't the cool thing for a long for about a stretch of eight years um and so this guy had a star wars holiday special on i was like oh my god and he was like yeah it's it's not good but you know and i bought it and I went home, and it was VHS, and it was really crummy, and it was a, a total letdown. And I'd seen images in Starlog, and I'd remember some stuff vaguely. And so I reconnected with it then, and then a couple of years later, I bought a copy at the Jersey Shore. Some other guy had a VHS. He's like, oh, this is the best copy. So then I bought a copy of that one, and it wasn't much better. And over the years, I just found different copies, or people would give me a CD-ROM with their version of it, you know. So... It was one of those things where I collected it out of uh, curiosity more than it was like raw affinity. It was like, all right, this is a joke. It's so bad. Sure, I'll, I want to watch this version. Um, and obviously things like YouTube and stuff became a way for it to live on because it was in, in the eyes of Lucasfilm dead and they were doing nothing to reconnect it to the culture. Uh, they wanted it to be dead. And so, for whatever reason, fans kept it alive. And here we are, you know, all these years later, 45 years later, and it's still somehow out there in the fan culture and in the zeitgeist to something that people are aware of. You see people making their holiday specials, the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special last year, and there's Lego Star Wars holiday specials. So they're okay to reference it. And now it's infiltrated the theme parks. And now Kenner put out a three and three quarter inch Chewbacca in his red snuggy action figure. That is amazing. That's like the most beautiful action figure ever. That's the stuff that you dreamed about when you were a kid, finally getting that. So it's great to see them opening the floodgates and allow merchandise to be made and allowed to be talked about. And so it felt like the right time to be making this documentary. It was a three-year journey. Um, but at the beginning of that, we did start to see like things loosen up in terms of Lucasfilm mentioning it, referencing it, talking about it, uh, joking about it. Um, Mandalorian had obviously put some references in and JJ had publicly talked about it, Favreau had talked about it, so it was out there, you know, I think at one point the Star Wars show did their own fake holiday special 
with Constable Zuvio. I think that was 2016 they did one. Um, so why did this thing that was so bad and, and such an anomaly in terms of quality endure? And that's what I think we all wanted to explore and answer and not make a judgment and not just cast aspersions about its quality you could easily make something that just totally makes fun of it. But we want to actually get to the core of it, talk to the people who are there on set that were still with us and explore this kind of lost moment in Star Wars history. And it's lost because there's so many new things that catch our eye that we want to talk about. There's so much new Star Wars that you don't really go back to 1978 and think about what Lucasfilm was like, what Star Wars was like. And also because there's a conscious effort on the part of Lucasfilm to not talk about it too. They're not doing a lot of retrospectives on it, but they are doing stuff adjacent. You know, you go to theme park and you get a Chewbacca Red Snuggie, but not everyone knows where it came from. You know, you can't go to Disney Plus and turn it on and watch it. So it's in this weird place. And, but it was enough, I think, where we knew it could connect with people and find an audience. Enough people knew a little bit about it to be curious. And that's a good documentary. You're like, I think I know what it's about. This is interesting. I guess I'll watch it and learn more. If you already know too much about it, it's not an interesting subject. So it felt like it fit in that category of just enough mystery where we could then tell a 90 minute story about it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Pete, you want you got a question here? Yeah, I mean, you spoke about um, Disney not wanting to maybe air it or make it part of their rotation. Did you go to Disney during your pre production to see if they had any interest in making this documentary, or was this definitely just? kind of solo with you guys oh of course we talked to um adam f goldberg who's one of the producers you know the goldbergs just won for muppets mayhem was his latest show under disney umbrella um he had a deal at disney and we talked to disney plus and lucas about it and there was very early interest i was like this is great we love it and suddenly we got the actually no don't make it kind of we can't do it kind of thing but we'd already made it at that point we were already making it and um it's out there in the world there's been copies on youtube uh for 14 years that they haven't shut down or taken down so it's not like those copies are infringing upon their the, the money they would make they've let this stuff exist it's it is what it is um and we weren't just telling the story of the holiday special we we're telling the story of early star wars uh from the mouths of the people who lived it it's their truth and old archival footage and talking about variety shows in general so it was bigger than just the holiday special uh, we're kind of capturing a moment in 1970s late 1970s american television culture um it's a very strange weird landscape on tv and exploring that and putting the special into context. And that took a lot of work. And it's also maybe bigger and different than what Disney would do if it was a Disney Plus thing. You know, I think it would have a different tone if it was a Disney Plus. Um, I mean, I think a lot of the content they do would have a certain um, corporate positivity to it that I don't know if you would get that all from some of the, the different luminaries we spoke to and or if they'd even want to hear from some of those original guys that were part of it, the writers, the directors, you know? Um, so I don't know. I, I think it's good. We made it independently. I think it needed that independent and objective voice. Um, we aren't out to ruin the special or to aggrandize it. We're just out to, to talk to these people, create an open space and have them tell their truth and, and kind of showcase some of the madness that went into it and some of the beauty. Uh, Nick, you're up. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that. Um, so what was your, this is a two-parter here. So what, what were your favorite or your favorite interview subject? And then also, was there anyone that you did not get a chance to interview that you wish you had? Um, well, yeah, for, I'll go to the second one. Harrison Ford. Sure. I'd love to talk to him. I talked to Mark Hamill. He enjoyed it, um, but he has, you know, there's a there's a, an agreement with George, I think, with him and the original actors that they're just not going to talk about it. And I think that's where he lived in that space. So we didn't end up sitting with Mark, but he watched it. Um, we debated about reaching out to George 
part of it was like, is he does he hate the special so much he's gonna try and kill our, our movie? Um and it felt like we had enough um objectivity and he probably doesn't want to talk about this that we didn't formalize any approach to him. Um I don't know that it would have maybe at the very end it would have been nice to hear something new from him about it. But, but I don't feel like it's worse because he's not in it. Um, I feel pretty satisfied with, with our directors, Jeremy Kuhn and uh, Steve Kozak um, did a really great job. Um, and I think there's a nice cross section of people from pop, pop culture and from the special itself's history kind of create a, a nice patchwork of, of voices. Um, so I don't feel like we're missing anybody. You know, I think we, we maybe Anthony Daniels would have been interesting, uh, but you only have, we made this for not a lot of money. Um, so he's in England. It would have been a whole big thing to get over there to get him on camera. Um, and you have to weigh those value judgments when you're making and producing a movie. Um, so I don't feel like the film's worse because anyone's not in it. So I feel like we're, we're pretty, we're comprehensive enough. In terms of uh, my favorite stuff, I, I think it's special that we have J.W. Rinsler in the doc, I believe it's his last interview before he passed away, and I'm a big fan of um, his scholarly looks into the making of Star Wars. I love his books on the making of Star Wars Empire, Return of the Jedi, Indiana Jones. I think he spent a lot of time on the inside, close with George, um, had a lot of great insight into the evolution of Lucasfilm in that era, the establishment of it up north in California. Um, you know, he talks about how nobody got fired from post the special. Yeah, it was a blip. Um, but his insight was really good because I think he spent so much time on the inside and he could he give some, some really like wonderful grounded looks and help put everything into context. So I, I, I was really pleased that we had him in this talk and also it's it's just was sad because he passed away shortly after we sat with him um it's probably my favorite part of it so uh i just wanted to say my favorite person that you got to interview was uh kevin smith you know a fellow a fellow jersey and and a uh, big fan of his movies and know he was a huge star wars fan so seeing his opinion on it was really he fantastic was, for me yeah he's great um he was super down we shot that at his uh theater in new jersey and he's he's always brings like a great um it's a great comedy edge but he also brings it personal keeps it personal like how he liked it how it felt when he first watched it you know that's what you want you want that that type of experience if you're going to sit down with somebody who didn't make it but he's like a luminary you know he's he's a filmmaker and, he, and he's a famous fan and and you know he was there day one so what was it like day one from a guy like Kevin Smith? I loved having people like that and Patton Oswalt and Paul Shear and they approach it very intelligently. Like like Patton Oswalt is a pop culture um, holocron. He just knows everything. He knows every special and when it aired and not even Star Wars. It's just like everything. And so he started bringing up stuff and we're like, oh, we already have that clip and we have this and, you know, and he was just like on it. He knew everything about like 1978 television it was unbelievable yeah i was have to say in terms of the guests too i feel like whenever taron kellum came on the screen i felt like he was always getting to talk about the most absurd stuff in the documentary in the special itself like he always had me in stitches with like some of his one liars about stuff we were watching in the special yeah taron taron was great i loved his stuff about the uh uh, the, the the cult parallels to when the wookies are walking off into uh the light at the end yeah, for sure here. And uh, Heaven's Gate, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Definitely some crazy stuff here. And uh, we talked about this when we reviewed the documentary. We learned so many crazy things like <laughs> that were either in the draft of the special or why it happened, such as like Han Solo being married to a Wookiee in one of the original drafts or uh, that they had to light the final set with candles because they ran out of money for the last uh, big musical number at the end with Carrie Fisher year. Like one year piece, the craziest thing you found out when you were doing your research for this film. Uh, well, two things. Steve Kozak, the co-director, also wrote a companion book called Disturbance in the Force, 
Uh, you can find that on Amazon. It's got a lot of additional anecdote stuff that didn't make it into the movie. Um, that's got some incredible stuff. Um, you know, we did find out that Grace Slick from Jefferson Airplane slash Starship, she had been kicked out of the band, I believe, at the time. Went to rehab or something. But she found out they were shooting this Star Wars thing and felt completely left out because she was such a big part of the band. So I, the rumor is she was trying to break onto the lot to get into the filming of the special. Which is kind of crazy thinking that, you know, this former lead singer was was desperate to get in this thing, which turned out to be the biggest train wreck of all time. Um, it wasn't totally confirmed. Some of the band were like, I don't know about that. But we heard from a couple other people that were there that were like, yeah, she was desperate. So... I don't know. There's things like that. We just, it, there's not enough time in the movie to explore it fully. And it would have taken too long to set it up. So we couldn't fully explore it. But yeah, there was, there was a lot of little anecdotes like that. You just kind of have to leave them on the cutting room floor because it doesn't service the big, the greater story. Um, and we wanted this thing to be lean and mean, like 90 minutes and not be bloated and you know, overly talky and wanted to be fun. That was a big part of this is I think it's a pretty fun and funny documentary compared to a lot of documentaries, which are very self-serious, very heavy. We wanted this to be something that you could watch with your family and something that could replace the holiday special itself. I, I would tell people to watch this before they watch the special. So you go into that experience with some context, because if you just go and watch the Star Wars holiday special, and you have no idea what you're getting in for it's invariably going to be a supreme letdown. Um, so I think you watch this first as a primer and then watch it, and you might get a lot more out of that that two-hour experience. Awesome. So um, really quickly, you talked about the holiday special. I want to go back to the special itself. What do you feel the legacy of the holiday special is? I mean, it's lived on, right? We've seen YouTube. Um, obviously, there's interest in it by by fans, and fans know about it. What do you feel the legacy is that was left by this holiday special for the average fan or the super fan? I don't know if it has a direct legacy. Um, yes, the legacy is some jokes. The legacy is there's a lesson in it that yeah even the greatest things can have you can you can make a follow-up in a bad way gotta be very careful i think it's the legacy that endured behind the scenes that george was probably deeply affected by this experience that he had no control over that as he was his company and star wars was taking over the world and he was getting big and he was about to go make this new movie and his, his big investment in empire strikes back and his eyes on the ball doing that and setting up a company up north um he took his eyes off it for a second and lets other people go make something and it quickly turned out to be subpar and he could not stop it he could not bury it and his name was on he could take his name off but that's all he could do and it wasn't his fault, but it definitely could have ruined all the good that he had created from the work he did with the original Star Wars. And it could undermine other ventures, especially if he's investing all the money, the 30 something million or whatever he did into ultimately the Empire um, and his new venture. So I think it shaped him as a man and how we, we then experienced Star Wars because we had this huge gap between 83 and 99 where he's saying i'm taking a break i'm raising a family and i'm not gonna let anyone else go do this if i'm gonna ruin it i'm gonna do it myself and i think that's the enduring legacy of it is that it taught him a lesson that he has to be the exec producer and he has to be paying attention and he can't just let people go off and make star wars it's probably hard for him right now that he's sold his creation and other people are going and doing things. I don't know what it must be like for him as a fan to watch new Star Wars. Um, I know I've heard him say that he's like the one person in the world that never got to see Star Wars because he made it. He can never see it as a, as a person untainted by its evolution and development. He was there for every step of it. He can't just ever watch it objectively. Um, now he's kind of forced to do that. And I, I think he wasn't going to ever put himself in that position early in his career 
after the holiday special to endure other people's Star Wars versions ever again. So I think that's the legacy is that George said, no, I'm going to control this thing. and It's mine. <laughs> you don't get to play with it unless I'm letting you. Yeah, for sure here. And I'm also curious what your opinion of this is. Obviously, in the last couple of years, I mean, you mentioned the Disney Ross merge acquisition. They got the property, but they have let the cartoon from the holiday special exist on Disney Plus. The Boa Fett, Tale of the Faithful Wookiee cartoon is on there. Like, I think it's funny in some comparison that, like, this thing is in so buried that they allow this one piece to exist for a modern fans to see. Like, what was your reaction when you first saw it? They let this thing out of the, out of the dungeon, basically. I mean, at the time we were making this documentary, we were excited. We're like, look at that. They're they're acknowledging its existence, you know? Um, though that was one of those watershed moments where we're like, yeah, we're we're doing the right thing here. This this story needs to be told and and clearly there's an an, an appetite for people who are aware of it. Um, every holiday season, there's another flurry of news articles about the holiday special IGN and everybody writes the Star Wars holiday specials coming November 17th it's life day blah 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 there's this um, annual interest in it despite whatever they want to do to not talk about it if they really don't want to talk about it then don't let it permeate your theme parks don't put out the faithful Wookiee don't do the Star Wars Lego holiday special don't make references to it in Mandalorian but they're doing it they're allowing it to perpetuate so that was cool seeing it i love that that's one of the best segments that's beautiful i wish there was like a whole animated show back in 1978 uh the, the adventures of these these heroes um i'm sure it would have been bonkers kind of like the old marvel comics and a little unhinged but it's um you know it wasn't to be but i thought there was a cool style of animation and george handpicked those guys one one story was George flew those guys down from Toronto to talk about the Nelvana guys to talk about making the this animated sequence. And he picked them up at the airport, I think, and he took them to Taco Bell. That's where they had their, their big meeting. <laughs> and I think they went back to the airport after Taco Bell and flew back to Toronto or something like that. But it was like, what? You went to, of all the places, you come from Toronto to meet with George Lucas and he drives you to Taco Bell. Just felt like very George. It doesn't surprise me, honestly, with all I see with uh, with George. So uh, one of our last questions here is, um, or I guess maybe our last one actually, is uh, what do you hope that people take away from the documentary Disturbance in the Force? Like when someone watches it, they finish watching it, what do you think they, what do you hope that they take with them and tell their friends about or whatever they may do with that information? First of all, I hope they were, they had fun and they were entertained. That's the point. You want to with zero pretension you just want people to get their money's worth and enjoy themselves and learn something i think people should should leave it and go wow i was about thought it was just about the holiday special but it's actually about a lot more than that it actually is about um I mean, the psychology of the artist it's about ownership artist ownership you know like you can walk away from something you can disown something it changed hands in terms of directors uh, the purity of art and commerce can, how do they coexist? But really it's about, it's a portrait of this period, this lost period in Star Wars history. So I'd say it's about more than just the holiday special. It's like a look at early Lucasfilm and American television in that era, variety shows at large. Well, that, that's actually what I took away from it was what you just, the last part you just mentioned, just television and that time. That's exactly what I took away from that. So I'm glad you said that. That's good to hear. Yeah, I think I also took away from that too. You mentioned it as well, like like sort of just the understanding of like. Being... Yeah, we really wanted it to. Yeah, I think what my thing kind of what I was saying. My takeaway was sort of like besides what Nick mentioned here, also the idea that like understanding why this thing is being made because like we start to realize it now where you have social media and you have the internet and you have like TikTok, Instagram, like back in 1977, there was only one movie that was it, and I could see this thinking of George Lucas saying like. We got to keep it fresh people's minds before we have another movie in three years. Absolutely. That's another, the, the, he was wise to that, knowing that he had a hot fan base. He had, he had a hit. Um, 
And if he's putting all his own money into a sequel, like he can't let this thing disappear. He can't let its thunder be stolen by another movie or a future franchise. He just did whatever he could to keep it relevant. Got it on rea- uh, variety shows, made this thing, greenlit comic books, greenlit some Brian did anything he could to keep it out there in, in pop culture. And that was his mindset. That was the equivalent of, you know, having, you know, Star Wars Instagram to update you every week and put out social media. They didn't have that. And so in lieu of that, they had to harness these rare, rare weird television appearances and, and the special itself, which is, it is a lesson in and of itself that like, even if you've got something that's so perfect and magical, you can easily mishandle it, which it you know, could have destroyed Star Wars. You know, thankfully it didn't. Uh, but it was, it was, it was pretty bad. <laughs> awesome. So uh, before we let you go, um, just want to tell the folks who want to watch The Disturbance of the Forest, you can find it on Apple TV, uh, rent or buy it. Um, Kyle, if there's anyone else you can find it, please let us know. But also, too, um, is there any future projects that you're working on that we should be uh, have on the radar here? Oh, let's see. That future you can disclose, well, obviously. Yeah, I'm I'm at work um directing co-directing the uh documentary on the history of Dungeons and Dragons the 50th anniversary is 2024. So that should be out later this year and um that's another subject I'm I'm extremely passionate about. I've written co-written two history books on Dungeons and Dragons and two cookbooks, official Dungeons and Dragons cookbooks and one of them got turned into a show which is called Heroes Feast, named after the, the first cookbook. And that's on Plex and Freebie. And we did that with um, with Hasbro. So I'm really excited about those things. There's still new episodes of Heroes Feast dropping every week. And um, there's more. There's more stuff coming I can't talk about yet, but really cool book stuff. Um hopefully more stuff in in the star wars space too so we'll see but for now a lot of stuff with dungeons and dragons and and um you know this has been a great ride releasing this the 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 festival reactions were incredible the critical reactions were great and it's most important uh most impressive seeing the wonderful fan reactions from the fan community people sharing it and having fun with it and um that's what you want you want that fan community to get it and feel like you spoke to them and they they speak back to you and that that's awesome that's been so rewarding and it's a tiny little independent movie you know it's really like four or five of us friends made this thing and it's great to see it out there so um again yeah thank you guys for for checking it out for talking about it for having me on that's pretty awesome thank you so is there a uh a fanboy sequel surrounding the Force Awakens coming anytime soon. You know, we've always talked about a fanboy's sequel or a fanboy's series. It's complicated because there's a lot of big producers involved in the original um and big companies. The rights have shifted a few times. It was complicated for a while. We've come close a few times. The dream has never died. Uh, I think everybody that is involved in the original would love to do more with it. It's strange that it's taken so long. Um, I don't know what it would be at this point. We've talked about a show. We've talked about a movie. Um, Both have actually come close. Uh, nothing's, Nothing's dead, but nothing's like totally active. But I this year we're gonna figure out some stuff. Yeah, at least the fifteenth anniversary. So maybe. Yeah. Fifteenth anniversary. So maybe, hopefully. Yeah, Kyle, thanks again for taking the time to talk to us as well. Thank you, Kyle, for your busy schedule. I appreciate it. If fans want to follow you on social media, get more information on what you're up to. How can they do that? I am Kyle underscore Newman on Twitter, Kyle underscore Newman on Instagram. Um, I'm on threads. If you're on threads, I'm on Facebook with Kyle Newman fan page. So always down to, to talk star Wars or hear what you think. If you check out the doc, um, send me a message. Sounds I'm, good. I'm always chatting. Thank yeah. you. That's good. Thank you for all the time. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you guys. It was great. 
Guys, that was a fun interview with Kyle. I mean, he had a lot of great insights here. I'm glad we that we got to talk to him and let us know, audience, what you think of this interview and like what you took away from it, Pete. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you give Kyle a follow on Twitter and all social media. I mean, like he said, he has some projects coming that we don't know about. He's got a pretty cool Dungeons and Dragons thing coming out too. So, uh, you know, want to thank Kyle again for coming on and, and taking the time to talk about the behind the scenes. Um, you know, hopefully you guys felt as strongly as we did about the information that he was giving. Yeah, for sure here. And uh, Nick, next week, we're going to go to back to Mandalorian a little bit because we talked about in the news section earlier about the big news that came out from Mandalorian. We're going to break down deeper detail here about this Mandalorian movie. We would have done it this week, but we couldn't pass the chance to talk to Kyle Newman. No, we could not. We could not. But um, very excited for next week. We're going to do a little reaction and then maybe even a little uh, little character draft. Yeah, we can My Funko look- Pop collection is starting to get stale. Yeah, we might have to do the character draft early here, Pete, because I feel like with the with this movie situation, like it's not fun if we know the entire cast list for you the draft. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I feel like doing it early will definitely uh, put someone on top or put someone way low, way on the bottom. It's probably going to be me, probably on the bottom, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Oh, he's just running down the hallway. Yeah, What's he's got. I love like- that. <laughs> Yeah, he's going to collect some Funkos here, but uh, I want to thank you guys for coming on here as well. So, Pete, if you want to follow you on social media, how can I do that? At Consi29 on Twitter, C-O-N-S-Y, and AP Tyler 308 uh, created this background on Reddit, so give them a check out. All right, Nick, one more time. If you want to follow us on social media, how can I do that? At Sky Guys Podcast. It's on Instagram. It is on X, so Twitter X, Threads, and TikTok. Yep, you can also follow me on social media, mphilips331, it's M-P-H-I-L-I-P-S. 331 this week over on the Justin and Suffering podcast. We're going to get you ready here for the, the divisional round of the playoffs here. So we're going to have some more picks. We're going to do some NFL coverage and we're going to break down all the locals. I haven't decided which one yet, but we're going to talk about the outlook for 2024 right of the Jets with the Giants this week, Nick. Can you believe the Packers beat the Cowboys 41 nothing? That's like a repeat of the Jets Colts 2002. Yeah. Can you believe it? I cannot believe it here, but that's coming up here next week. We'll be back with the Mandalorian and Grogu reaction, plus the character draft. But until then, may the force be with you.